Hey, welcome to Skeptic Hangout, the place where we sit back, relax, and chit chat about intriguing and sometimes controversial topics through the lens of skepticism. We are Josh, Richard, and once again, guest host Nate. Today we're going to talk about the red, white, and blue. So throw back some pickle juice, hot dog flavored water, and a cold beer as we talk America. <laughs> The country with the worst beer in the planet. Uh, actually, that's old legend. That's completely wrong. So we're going to start talking about beer all of a sudden because that's a stereotype that's gone way the fuck off for a long time. It's because true, of, man. That's the, no, no, no. You're talking about popular beer. If you see, and unfortunately, if you see a, a can with the American flag on it, you're probably drinking a bad beer. It's probably piss water. But if you, we had the craft brewery sensation going on and our beer has gone to the best probably in the world. I'm not the most like gung-ho patriotic person but i will die for our beer i will not let you put that down as like a negative amount of america that's the best thing we have going for it is we got our our craft beer and we got our american cheese well you know what if your recent <laughs> scotus decisions are are any indication i have no doubt that beer is the best part about the united states right now but as a skeptic josh i'm going to have to demand evidence so you're going to have to send me some of this fabulous craft beer. And in response, I will send you some of our far superior Canadian craft beer. Honestly, if I thought we could send it, I would. But I'm pretty sure you can't send alcohol. like. That. No, you can't. I tried to send some beers to uh, Christy Powell, the host of Secular Sexuality, and it got sent back. So, yeah. Yeah. No, so unfortunately, can't. that's a, you'll just have to come to San Diego sometime because that's where the best brewery is. Not that I live there, but it's pretty damn close to where I live. They have the best beers, but this isn't a beer episode as much as I would love it to be. We're talking about America, and I thought it, this would be an interesting one to go with, with two people that aren't Americans, so they can go into how we're viewed it from other countries, and then I can, just like now with the beer, I can confirm or deny whether or not they're right about us with that. And with the beer so far, the way they perceive America is wrong. So far, we're doing pretty good, America. I've not even been asked about American beer. <laughs> Citation needed. <laughs> yeah. I, um, okay, I, I've talked about America a lot on the non-profits. Um, that was a good start, Richard. <laughs> I've talked about America a lot on the non-profits as yeah. well. So much that I have nothing left. <laughs> <laughs> nothing else to say. Uh well, like, how do you view Americans? And not, not As, me, not me. Not, right, okay. Americans so in general. Before I'd ever met any Americans, I had a stereotypical image of Americans as a kind of fat Hawaiian shirt wearing, uh, kind of like the, the, the cop from Smokey and the Bandit, the kind of... Oh, I thought you were going to go for like Tom Selleck, Magnum P.I. No. I guess, I guess no. maybe that's a lot of us. <laughs> and and of when I... When when I first met Americans, it was when I was visiting other tourist attractions in Britain. One was the Tower of London, and one was Loch Ness. And on both occasions, they fit the stereotype I already had uh, uh, <laughs> of them. Uh, however, were, were the tours I, wearing like American flag clothes though? <laughs> pretty much, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> uh, However, I actually have some friends from uh, the kind of Bay Area, and uh, when when they've come across to Britain, which has been they're, they're in a band, so they come across on tour every so often. And uh, I first met them about probably going on twenty years ago now, and we've kept in touch, and we are you know pretty good friends now, and. They completely changed my perception of Americans uh, because they were kind of more liberal. They, uh, you know, 
not not American flag wearing <laughs> <laughs> uh, big fat touristy types whatsoever so they uh, completely changed and, and then I started meeting kind of people like you online and things and, and that further changed my perception so my the outside of the world perception of America or certainly the British one is is very different to Americans in reality certainly the ones that I've met and I've not gone out of my way to meet kind of liberal uh people with the same ideas as I have. I just It just happens to be that the Americans I've met in real life are actually quite nice people and don't fit the stereotype. What, what about you, Nate? What do you think of us? Uh, I love Americans. I think of all the people and cultures of the world. I think Canadians and Americans are probably the closest in terms of our values, in terms of our behavior, despite the the stereotypes that both of us may share. Um, the big difference that I saw, uh, again, being in the Army and having traveled um, quite a bit, is, is with other countries' perception of us. So Americans get a pretty bad rap in Europe, which to me is weird because it's like, especially in France, because it's like, it's like, come to France and we will together make fun of the country that saved the Swiss from the Germans. <laughs> and, and, and you kind of get that, you get that kind of anti-American sentiment pretty much anywhere I went in Europe. Um, and then having traveled as somebody who is obviously North American, um, but when they find out that you're Canadian, their demeanor completely changes. It's it's like night and day difference with with the way that they treat you, which I always thought was kind of unfair because the United States has done a lot in the last hundred years to contribute to, you know, European, U Europe not becoming a fascist super state, right? So like, I feel, I feel like that's kind of an unfair treatment but but it is one that I definitely definitely felt in my travels. But as far as as Canada goes, y'all are cool. We're seriously worried about you right now, but we're we're hoping you'll come back from the break. I think I kind of understand why so many countries have a problem with us or have a distorted view of us because uh, America <coughs> is bigger than so many other countries. Not I don't know about Canada, but we're so diverse in uh where we're at where like almost every state is like another little country that just happens to speak english just a little bit differently pretty close though for the most part but uh, uh the problem is our country still elected a buffoon into the white house for four years and he was an active buffoon and, and very much held on to like white nationalist ideas fascist ideas seemed to like uh, buddy up to dictators like uh, North Korea and stuff like that so like you see here the president who is basically the face of the country unfortunately the very orange ugly face he's not president anymore but he left us he left a big orange stain all across our map and uh, like that's what people are seeing that they saw that as what people wanted and like, we projected our ignorance out into the world with uh, acting like COVID was just an American thing and acting like that if, when they do the conspiracy theories and forgetting that like people in other countries have found the same disease out there, but we're, they're going to go like, it's an American uh, conspiracy disease to get uh, Trump out of the white house. So like we had dumb mentality that we were projecting out into the world. And I understand why people feel that way. I feel like a lot of America is what the stereotype is not everywhere. There's a lot of good people in there. That's why I, I all these, uh, uh, petitions to like let Texas secede from the nation uh, rub me the wrong way because they forget like yeah there's a lot of a-holes in Texas but there's a lot of great people in Texas as we know a lot of good people in Austin so like yes the, the problem with America is we de we're definitely a melting pot but we're a melting pot of loud assholes uh, resisting the uh, uh, leftists and then there's way too many people in the middle that don't have seem to care to lend out their voice at all. So you can't hear any of like 
what regular people are like. And I'm definitely one of the latter leftist people complaining, but I still th wish that the people in the middle would take a little bit, would get out of their uh, uh, shadow or whatever and like raise their fucking voices. I don't know yeah, that it's necessarily like resisting leftists. I feel like the religious right in the United States is seriously overrepresented, you know, be, because of the way that your your civic system is set up and, and you know, gerrymandering and all these other problems well, in the Christian loud, nationalist movements. I made sure yeah, to say loud people on the right. I'm not yeah. necessarily saying they outnumber us. No, they definitely don't. And that's the thing. That's what I'm saying is they definitely do not outnumber the progressive Americans, but they're louder and they're over overrepresented and they galvanize in a way that the left doesn't because they can galvanize around an asshole like that orange orangutan that y'all voted in there in 2016, even though he panders to the Christian right while espousing literally zero Christian values. Like he has no Christian values whatsoever. He's, he would be, he's literally the worst Christian on the planet, but yet somehow he's been able to ensnare all these people because of the political machine that exists down there. And that, I think if, if y'all could shed that, you could perhaps return to your position as, as, as a leader in the, on the planet. We're definitely a country with a power dynamic that has issues, though, because even though the, the right, the, the Christian nationalists, they're not like the majority, but they, they've set up our like voting systems to where it, That's gerrymander, what I'm saying. it gerrymanders around them. And our whole political system goes for them because of the people that we elect on the left, uh, they try too often to play by the rules. And by playing on the rules, they let the right stomp all over them and cheat their way into like more and more power. And that's why we're losing more and more power. And it's like, it definitely, it felt like a joke, like satire saying like, uh, we could possibly be a country that goes into anything like uh, Margaret at, at Wood's uh, hand, handmade sale. And now every single day, it starts to seem more and more like a looming possibility. So like all those uh, all those great things you said about the country, those people exist, but those people are losing more and more power. And it could be very well soon that uh, the America that was okay is no longer existent because of once the power takes over, it, they're going to be able to take charge of what people are learning. Like they're already trying to do with CRT. They want to show the good white history. And it's again, propaganda getting them in place where this is what people will leave and going up against all the social progress that we've made before. How, how intertwined is religion in, in that then? I know you're supposed to have a separation of uh, church and government, but uh, as, as we've covered many, many times, that that is very, a very, seems to be, to me anyway, a very blurred line. And if you have a look at the, the uh, recent overturning of the road versus way, Wade case with the Supreme Court and if you have a look at the makeup of the Supreme Court there's six Catholics, two Protestants and a Jew on there they're all actively religious people who all take their interpretation of morality from the same 2000 year old dusty old book <laughs> uh, Well, like um, so how, how, how much is that does that have an effect in real as an American educating outsiders how much does religion have an effect in everyday real life in in the u.s well, it really wasn't supposed to have any effect from government like the people the founders they liked the christian right like to point out like it was a christian nation when it was founded it wasn't like at most they were deists mm -hmm. and stuff like <laughs> it, it, it like they, they'd say creator and keep it as vague as possible and i have like deist notions of what what america was and then they've latched onto those words and twisted it into their own thing just because they have popularity but founding there was supposed to be a separation between church and state like but that doesn't seem to exist anymore and because and the people in power don't seem to be fighting that at all we've had uh politicians doing like uh uh, I think Lauren Bober not too long ago did a fundraiser within a church, which should never be happening with a politician. She didn't get any kind of trouble. It's like they've almost overwhelmed it to the point where uh, the separation 
that we should be getting upset about them breaking. It's happening so often that it's just like blase now. Nobody seems to care. Where where I'm at, like, luckily I'm in a place where I can be openly atheist and nobody seems to give a crap about it. I've had like one person in my entire life that has been like, you're an atheist, but you don't look like a Satan worshiper. So like there are <laughs> pockets of America where uh, uh, it's okay to have separation of church and state. And, but there's also uh, the problem is in Washington, DC, that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Separation of church and state is non-existent. It's it's definitely eroding. You know, um, <clears throat> Lauren Boebert, I think, during that exact same rally said that she was sick of all this separation of church and state junk and said uh, that's not even in the Constitution. It's in a dumb letter and it doesn't even mean what they think it does. And she's right, but for all the wrong reasons, because Jefferson wrote. He first wrote about this, the wall of separation between church and state in a letter to the Baptist Convention um, in response to their concerns about being reduced to irrelevance in, in this new nation. They were worried that they were going to be completely washed away. And Jefferson was writing to them to try to reassure them that they would have their religious freedoms that there was going to be a separation, like you're allowed to be here. This isn't what we meant by the, the by, by this document that you're reading. And then it's been completely turned around by, by people like Lauren Boebert, who can barely craft a sentence and yet see the, and yet would presume to completely reverse the spirit of what the guy who wrote the fucking declaration of independence had to say, like, not only, I, I doubt that she's even read that fucking letter. I have. I've also read most of the Federalist Papers, not all of them, but I've, I've, I've read most of them. I'm working my way through. But like the, the, the dissonance from these people who, who cherry pick what they want to hear and what they want to say and then completely ignore everything else, the vast mountain of literature and dialogue that was said and then say, well... Well, I understand it because I read this one catchphrase or I've read like, oh, like you said, endowed by their creator. And and that means that they all believed in God. The man had a copy of the New Testament with all the magic shit cut out. Yeah, it, it, it's so weird. And like we mentioned Roe v. Wade getting overturned and the decisions don't seem to match up with like what happened in uh, in the court case. It doesn't seem like they're justifying anything with anything other than what the religious standpoint is of life begins at inception so or conception so it's it's kind of murder and it's wrong and they don't think that they should uh be having the right to privacy with those kinds of matters it, there was nothing in it that linked to anything uh, other than religion for the reasons for why they did it like it was a it listen to opening arguments so i'll explain it much better but everything seemed to be love bullshit. opening arguments everything seemed to be bullshit for the reasoning for why it was overturned and now we're going to see that more stuff go down like gay marriage just barely became a thing i remember when i was in in a junior college uh and they, we were doing voting on that in California and somehow in junior college, it still like fucking fell through and eventually happened later on. Gay marriage is brand new. The only reason why it's ever, why it was ever opposed was religious reasons. There's cause right. I can't think of a single secular reason why anybody would give a shit about two consenting adults doing something, but they, they're probably going to, we're probably going to regress back now and get rid of that for people, which I know some people that that's going to be a, go wrong for i know some people that are actually going to be affected by that and it's terrible so right now i'm definitely i'm the american and i'm coming off other than beer i'm coming off the most pessimistic about where we're at right now and it's really really hard not to be a pessimist right now it, it's really hard not to for it not to look pessimistic even from the outside the the, the whole the, the thing i mean i i'm I'm trying very hard not to go down the religious route, but because that's kind of where my it's too late interest too late, lies, Richard. But just commit, buddy. Just commit. The 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 kind of whole the whole stance and how they interpret the Bible and make laws from it is absolutely ridiculous. If we, had, I know, I said just for the point of view of the viewers, I, I was talking to Josh earlier this evening, and I said I don't want to talk about abortion, and I'm the one bringing it up. 
But the, uh, the, the, the abortion's not, uh, uh, isn't, the Bible isn't against abortion. It actually prescribes abortion. God himself prescribes <laughs> abortion in the Bible. There's and, a recipe, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, it's, uh, uh, that's in numbers if anybody wants to look it up. If uh, it's, re- it's the, the interpretation that p- these people have of, of what the Bible says seems seems to be absolutely unrelated to what's actually in the book. And yet they're making moral laws which affect people's lives based on this book, which they don't seem to understand. I don't think they've even read it. I think they just they just go to the local pastor who, who gives them his interpretation and which which has nothing to do with what's actually in the book. And they're like, oh yeah, that's what the Bible says. We'll go with that one. And then they make decisions which affect thousands and thousands and thousands of people and put people's lives in danger based on it. And it, it seems ridiculous to me. And and I don't see that in any other country. Uh, 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 not No Western country, at least. But from, I mean, it, it doesn't seem to happen in Canada. It certainly doesn't happen in Britain. And we have... Uh, an intermingling of church and state uh, the you know religion is in our politics and and we don't have that kind of behavior and it just seems a bit bizarre to me well i've read that's our problem is we don't have a, a national religion and that's how like your country didn't become so radicalized about it it almost became like a blase background kind of thing that didn't really matter it's just like it's almost just tradition that you happen to have it and then in america we had the evangelicals all those fighting for position of the dominant religion to the point where it became fanaticism so boring tradition versus fanaticism you're gonna get a different kind of crowd and that's why we have an ignorant very loud religious crowd is because that i almost think we could have done better with a with a, a country religion that everybody just ignores the hell out of but i again that's me doing revisionist history and pretending i know where things could have gone things could have gone just as bad if we had a a country religion does uh, nate knows a little bit about american history so what's what's your kind of view on where it could have gone on if if things had been different oh it it would have been an absolute disaster had 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 there been a a state founded religion or, or a state sponsored religion in the infancy of the United States, that it would have completely fractured. It would have fractured multiple times. Like the the people that re, that started the colonies were escaping religious persecution. And then if you if you fast forward a bit um, beyond the Civil War, which arguably again was. A, had a lot to do with religion and and slavery uh and and if you fast forward again to say um the the beginning of the gilded age when there was this influx of irish and other immigrants that were again escaping the the protestant catholic wars and and all that strife there again if there had been a church or a state-sponsored religion that would have made things it would have been even more volatile than it was like the immigrants coming over from ireland suffered such huge discrimination and persecution and that was just racism you had religion on top of that and you would have had full-on fucking riots true so our, our melting pot idea is what makes what worked out in uh, the uk something that could not have worked out over here because of we were literally everybody's coming in here to form their own kind of culture. And that's why we needed that separation. So yeah, definitely would have led to chaos. Maybe like a hundred, 400 years from now, maybe it would have worked out okay in the long run, but right now it'd probably still just be chaos. Absolutely. It would have. And if you look at the, the actual statements that the, the folks that people like to call the founding fathers had to say, um, they are, almost they were exclusively non-religious even even the religious among them recognized that they wanted to create a secular state and that the country would be better off because of it and not one of them wanted wanted to have religion to have anything to do with it in fact in an early draft of of the declaration the creator's not even in there thomas jefferson had to be lobbied to put it in there he didn't want that in there. He wanted a completely secular document. 
Yeah, I read Andrew Seidel's book and I'm remembering that part now after I remembered why the UK was said uh, not to be like so fanatic fanatical about it. I don't know if there's a solution. Like there the only solution would be to like take away people's freedoms of religion, but we don't want the, the we don't want to be taking control of the churches. We also don't want the churches to be taking control of the government. We need government that's fucking doing something about all this fanaticism and just but I don't see that happening. The problem is we're vo- we're voting people into office that don't really care about the separation and want to like use it for their own good. And the lobbyists definitely aren't helping out because the lobbyists are pushing their own interests and like everybody's getting bought out. It's like hey, I'll, I'll tell you what the solution is. Route. Oh, let's, let's hear I'll it. give you an easy solution. Mm-hmm. Um, one, exp- expand the Supreme Court, I'm and all for two. It. Amend the Constitution, because the the Founding Fathers never meant for the Constitution to be a static document. It was meant to be a living document. They put in mechanisms for change. Um, Thomas Jefferson himself said that he was not, and and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said himself, I'm not a, uh, a proponent of frequent change to the Constitution, but it must be amended from time to time to reflect the evolu- the will of the people and the changing will of the people so and and that is evident in the actual wording of the document they meant for this to be changed they wanted it to be changed they knew that people's values would shift over time and that you know white slave owning landowners from the 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 18th century could not possibly hope to speak for people three four hundred years ago or in the in the future. Yeah. So they meant for this thing to be changed, and and that is what I think the true promise of the United States is: is that someday it will come along. Now I'm going to quote Dr. King, but someday it will come around and it will fulfill its promise. There, there's definitely like what it was founded for has idealism, and that we're going to continue to update the laws to reflect the culture the problem is the people in charge are going backwards on what the intent was and like right. they're trying to go back to what was said back then and reflect the culture of 1777 or something right and right. that's not what the constitution was about and so this whole originalism idea is the dumbest idea i've ever heard of when it comes to making laws you should not be going back to originalism like even what would be considered the greatest American hero back then? Probably a terrible person by today's standards. So there's no reason why we need to reflect back on them as like some heroes that we got to do exactly what they said, because like, like you mentioned, we owned slaves back then. Uh, Women didn't have uh, the right to vote for the longest time. Like we should not be going backwards. We should be moving forward with society's morals. And unfortunately it seems like I, I, I'm optimistic we'll get back to that idea one day, but it's going to be a long shift back into that where we're going to have to depend on the younger generations to get us back on track. Yeah, and what what truly scares me is that you've got someone like Clarence Thomas, who in his Roe versus Wade decision is literally issuing a an altar call for cases to challenge Obergefell and Plessy versus Ferguson in even even the sodomy law that was overturned like sodomy like the government is literally trying to get back into your bedroom and of the four landmark cases that he lists in his decision the next one back is interracial marriage and he's married he's a black man where married to a white woman and I like how can you not see that they're coming for you next. Like, I don't know if he just doesn't care or whether he knows he won't be alive by the time they get there or whether his cognitive dissonance is so deeply ingrained that it just doesn't register with him. Uh, like, I, I don't know. What, what do you guys think? I'm, that baffles me. Well, I, I think he intentionally left it off because he's an old guy and he doesn't see, see that effect in him any. I don't think, and I, I think that'll be a hard one to push through is taking out interracial marriage just because of where society is right now. I could see if it continued down the path that they're trying to go. I it's could the see next that, step. Yeah. I could see that becoming, becoming something on the table, but I definitely see th- them going after contraceptives. That's going to be probably a, next step probably after gay marriage is gone I, i'd say they're probably going to take they're probably going to be pretty close in hand and all those are that's that's terrifying this country is terrifying me with how it's going i 
we don't need to be bashing America the entire way, the entire time, though. Is we there... started off being nice. No, you, you started off <laughs> talking didn't. bad about our beer. <laughs> you started off being nice. <laughs> but, like, let's, see, let's <laughs> talk about uh, what good America has done. Instead of going just wallowing in a current events, we'll get but, back but, to current Before, we, t- oh, before we talk about what America's done, because when I... I, I want some clarification on on my childhood view of America because I, I grew up in uh, in the early eighties watching uh, shows like The Fall Guy and Dukes of Hazard and kind of as as time progressed Cagney and Lacey and all these great shows and I you know as a lot of people in Britain at the did at the time liked America through the TV we were watching we kind of got this this idea uh, you know that was our idea of america and and with all these heroes and blah 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 and and how realistic was that kind of vision was it was it just all artistic license or was there some reality to that i knew one of those references that you made (laughs) i know do some hazard and i can probably say that we definitely had some idiots in cars so with the uh, confederate flags on him so yeah that part's accurate uh i don't think uh, the heroism it reflected in any uh old t- television is accurate i'd say some maybe like some of the old timey values and like old things might be there but even like you go all the way back to it's a wonderful life i don't think a james stewart character exists i don't think a george bailey character exists ever there's nobody that's that altruistic and willing to give up like their dreams for everything. Uh, I do think we have Mr. Potters. I think that's uh, that's showing in America. And then damn it, you made me go pessimistic again. Uh, well, well, okay. What about pioneer, Teddy Roosevelt? Pioneering, Teddy Roosevelt. Pioneering shows like Star Trek that kind of laid out a vision for the future. A positive uh, vision for the future. I think that most of the people that watch it, because I know so many people on the right that love Star Trek, miss the point because, uh, <laughs> so again, it's it's a dividing culture. The people on the, I'd say, the people on the left want to reflect that. The people on the right think they reflect that. So I don't think either one is there, but one has the goals of what of what a, a Star Trek like fantasy would be, and the other one thinks they've already reached, despite being horrible, horrible, horrible people. So and to, to, to push back against what Josh was saying, that I don't think there's ever been that perfect American character, Teddy Roosevelt, right there. Possibly your best president. Definitely the person who most embodies what, American th- what America thinks they want to be. The proponent of the robust life. The man who fought back against big business and for the common man and for the rights of he, um, the man who basically created the national park system. He's a huge conservationist. He was also a trophy hunter, which you know we. Yeah, we covered not, on the last episode. Uh, yeah, we're not too big ago. into that, but you know what? I'll I'll let one thing slide, but he kind of he was sort of sandwiched in between and this kind of gets back to what i was thinking earlier with with america's tendency to to swing back and forth like you guys kind of seem to oscillate between populism and and your actual potential you know like you go from like george jr to clinton to or George Jr. to Clinton to George Jr. you know and and then it's like back and forth and back and forth and then with Obama it was a big swing to the left and then all of a sudden like a huge swing to the right it's because but, we can we can only stay like focused when things are going bad we get we almost become radicalized when things are going against our way so the left will get radicalized and angry when we have somebody far right and a monster uh, in in charge and then uh, when uh, somebody decent or okay comes in charge because I don't even think we go quite as left with any president besides maybe maybe uh, some choices that you can bring up because you seem to know history so much better than me but uh, uh, the right gets gets radicalized as soon as there's a little bit of progress so that's why it swings back and forth so much and we just need there are so many good people that if they could keep their focus, I think we would start doing better and not just get uh, get up 
and 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 like and focused and uh, voting when it's uh, just a presidential thing or when you need to be going all the time caring about what's going on. And I think we have people with short attention spans uh, that care, but they just need more. I think I said it six, seven times because I'm not art- that articulate. Uh, they need to stay more focused. <laughs> Take your riddle in America. Exactly. That could be that could be the tagline for this episode. <laughs> I don't think we usually do taglines, but this will be the first one. We'll be talking, Skip the King out, talking about America. Take your riddle in America. <laughs> so what, well, go on, Nate. I was just going to ask uh, Josh a question. What, what do you think that, uh, what time would you say was the peak of American culture? The thing is, like, I'm an 80s person. So, like, culture and, and just, like, entertainment, music, got to be the best in the 80s that's when robocop came out that's when first blood came out that's when uh king diamond and metallica and slayer were like starting out culture wise that's the most important part but i would say we were at our peak socially uh when obama was in the white house and because uh as because of that i'd say that's when uh, most people had the most rights we had somebody in charge that seemed to care although not everything he did was great but he genuinely seemed to care and then we took a nosedive with the next person. And I, I don't think even we've recovered with Biden. So like socially we know Obama, but culturally, I love women with big hair. I love that trashy 80s look that, that so many women had. Like everything about the 80s is for me culturally. And that's where I wanted to go for a little bit because uh, uh, we've given, despite all the flaws that America has, we've given you guys the best culture to latch on to because you guys watch our movies, you listen to our music, although we've gotten Rush from Canada, so thank you. And we got Judas Priest from uh, you, you Brits over there. And we, actually, I think I named King Diamond and he's Denmark. So I accidentally gave us credit for a Denmark musician. So like culturally, we've helped out things. We're the forefront of like where the cool movies come from until like Peter Jackson takes it all over to... Uh, uh, New Zealand. New Zealand and now that's probably where everything's going to go because less people are going to want to come here so like yeah culturally we're doing great but uh I feel like even that's going to be a swing soon agreed Richard what do you think um yeah I I agree I think we've 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 taken a lot from American culture I think at the height of American culture, I have to agree with Josh with the 80s for culture wise. Um, so, the, one point on the Biden thing, I don't want to just continually repeat what Josh has said, so I'll just skip over the rest of what I was going to say because I pretty much mirrors him. Um, Biden is kind of, I'd be surprised if a lot of people in Britain could actually name the president of the US now, because he just seems very lackluster. He said some good stuff. I've, I've read recently that he's, uh, he's, he's made some good comments about the uh, the Roe versus Wade overturning. Yeah. Uh, and, and he's trying to do something about that, which is good. But it just seems very kind of uh, vanilla. I think we and, settled yeah. for he's not a complete monster. And that's where we ended up at. Because, like, he was not my first choice. But because of, like, I kept my attention span, I realized we couldn't get the guy that I wanted in office. So I still voted, and I ended up voting for Biden because that was the better of two evils. There's so there's a, a mindset of, of so many Americans where we feel entitled, where if it's not exactly what we want, we're not going to do it. So we had a lot of people that refused to vote in this one. They refused to vote in the last one because they didn't like their choices and not, but the thing is the radical people on the right in America, they're, they're voting every single time for the most part. They're, they're the more, they have the drive almost every single election. So we, that's why we have the swing back and forth is because if it doesn't matter who's in the white or going for the white house on the right, they're going to vote for that person. On the left, if it doesn't meet all of our values, because we have we want so much, we want so much change, and that's good. It's great to want change. That's what I I I, I want to hark back on all the negativity. I know so many good people in America that want change to happen, but uh, we got to settle sometimes, and that's where we're struggling with. Is uh, so many people on the left have a hard time with compromise. We're we're spoiled in like 
we got so much great things from the 80s. We got the excess from the 80s. And we kept that attitude of we want it all. But we got to settle out occasionally for like a, 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 the third Candyman movie. And that it's like, it's a slasher. It's okay. It's not everything I wanted, but we can we can do a third Candyman. Yeah, you've had two extreme, extreme kind of uh, presidents from, from both sides of the coin with it. With Obama, who was really, really good, and the the uh, the uh, but was as again very polarized because the people who hated him really hated him, and then then the, the kind of or- orange balloony chap uh, with far too much money, and he he uh, he was polarized again because the people on the left really really hated him, and and then you've gone from that to kind of Joe who. Yeah, he's, and... he's very milk toast. Yes, yeah. he's quite boring. Very, I don't know. I I like the fact that he is someone who historically has been able to do bipartisan work. Like he was a um, he was a good friend of um, oh, what's his name? The guy he couldn't raise his shoulder, his arms over his shoulders. He died recently. John McCain. John McCain. Oh. Him and John McCain had a great friendship, even though they were completely opposite as far as their political views go. But though they were they were actually true statesmen, they were able to come together and work for the good of the people. And all I I think that America needs more of that. I don't think that Joe Biden is doing this in his current administration. I don't really particularly think he's a good great president. I think that he was someone with a name that they thought could beat Donald Trump. And at the time that was the most important thing was to beat Donald Trump. And uh, I don't know, Josh, if you could pick the democratic <clears throat> candidate, like, so let's say Trump runs again in 2024, like somehow he escapes prosecution <laughs> through the January 6th hearings, which I, I don't know. Surprised. I, I, I'm hope, I'm more hopeful than I used to be, but I still wouldn't be surprised if he didn't. So let's let's say that that he somehow escapes prosecution and somehow gets the Republican ticket for 2024. Who would you want to see? I honestly I'm not sure right now. I know I don't want to see Joe Biden running again. I no. 100% don't think uh, he has what it takes to overcome all the stigma against him already. And I I'm. I'm like lukewarm on him. I like that he seems to be trying. His record is nowhere, uh, before he became president, is nowhere near as liberal as he's become under presidency, which shows that he's at least listening to what people want, even if it goes against his past uh, record. But uh, I, I don't know who I want. I've, I've heard like some good things with Pete Buttigieg. I don't like, uh, uh, I don't, yeah, like I've heard good like lines from him, but I, I don't really know his platform well enough to like say 100%. And I, I, Bernie Sanders is too damn old. I don't. No, yeah, no, not Bernie. As much you know, as much as I would have liked him uh, in the last election, I don't want him now. So I'm not really sure uh, who AOC? I. AOC. AOC. I do want her to be president. I fucking love Honestly, AOC. I, she I, I is for... like she is my fucking queen. I forgot that she would be in running age. I, I was I was still going back with the last election, which I think the whole running age thing is dumb. We don't need older older out of touch people running the office aoc younger in touch she came from a, a working class uh family she's not somebody that just inherited her status yeah i'd go aoc she's so smart too oh my god she's so smart she, she's somebody that can give some kind of inspiration and like she actually does stuff when uh it, when texas was freezing over she went and helped the texans out while while uh what's his face uh the zodiac killer went out to another country <laughs> zodiac. Uh, richard who would you pick do you have anyone i i i know no one i literally do not know who the candidates are any candidates so i i couldn't say has anybody so... like officially announced anything like i don't not I don't... that i know of yeah, that's, you that's know who what... andrea ocasio cortez is though right yeah richard I... Well, you, you would probably... Well, oh, man, you would love her. You would absolutely love her. She is everything America should be. Yeah, she she's definitely, like, the American dream does seem to come up from her 
uh, story more than others, and that's something that a lot of the pe- a lot of the people on the right like to dunk on. Like, oh, you were just a bartender uh, before you got this job. I'm like, yeah, uh, a lot of Americans have working class jobs, and they didn't inherit their money from their family. That's a good thing. But then they'll act yeah. like Americans are lazy uh, if they don't have a job. But like, they were just bashing bartenders a few days ago. So <laughs> it's very much right. back and forth on that. All right. Uh, I think we're at 40 minutes. Uh, any, anything else that we need to add on this? Do, do we want to, let's end this on a positive note. Let's come up with something good about that's America. Desperate, desperate for compliments. Well, that, well I'm, not saying, <laughs> I'm not saying you say my positive thing. You're in America, Josh. I'm not saying say that. But although if that is your positive statement to say, you're allowed to say that. But let's get some positivity ending on this because I, I think that is negative. that is my positive statement. Look, we, we've we've I've been very vocal about the kind of British view and and a lot of the outside world's view about America when when I've done these kind of roundtable shows and things before. Um, it's not a positive. America doesn't have a very positive image outside. Uh, and what I would say, and what I have said, and what I will continue to say is go and talk, if you haven't, if you're from outside America, go and talk to Americans and meet some Americans because they are fucking lovely people. (laughs) They really, really are. And don't let the kind of image you get on your TV, I don't want to go all conspiracy, but don't get the image, let the image you see on your TVs and in your newspapers and on your your media sources, whatever they may be, uh, uh, skew the fact that Americans are lovely people some of my best friends are american and i you know i haven't got a bad word to say about the american people and i think separate that from the idea that you have of america because the american americans have a lot to offer and america could be a better place for some of that offering anything last words from you nate on the podcast, not like in life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize the sort the of the blue was hovering over did. above. <laughs> um, okay. America, top three best national anthems in the world. Best whiskey in the world. Number one, no. bourbon. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, no, 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 no. Scotch is second. Okay. <laughs> okay, Richard, I'm sorry. But scotch for me comes second. I do love scotch, but it comes second. And... Having having been in the military and served with Americans, you are a lot of things, but you are not cowards. This is why it bothers me to hear people talking about, I'm going to move to Canada every time something goes wrong, especially folks on the left. That is the most un-American thing I can think of. Y'all don't run away from a challenge. The challenge is to fix your country and fulfill your promise. And your neighbor to the north believes in you. I think you can do it. Well, fucking said, man. Uh, I want to say, I definitely, I, I'm a negative person overall. So that's why I keep leaning, leaning na- into negativity. I think there's a lot of good people in America, though. I hope I'm one of them. I think the majority of us are good people. It, it's the people in charge that are screwing it for the good people. So like when I think of Americans, I'm thinking of mostly good people, even sometimes, uh, people that are trying to be good and maybe take some missteps, which is what you're allowed to do. You're allowed to grow and learn. Uh, So um, Americans overall are great. I'm worried about where America is going, not where the American people are. So definitely I'm, I'm happy to be an American right now, as long as I still can keep my rights. And I'm not talking about running away, but I'm hoping that it doesn't go into something where uh, we do have to fight for our rights. Uh, This has been skeptic hangout. Richard, lift up the banner because of my memory is gone. Keep questioning, interrogate your beliefs, and stay skeptical. Thank you for joining us, Nate, and uh, we will see you all next time. Thanks, Nate.